Amen, amen. So today is the last week in the You Asked For It series, and this week essentially um, is a continuation of the last two weeks. It's like a mini-series inside a series, and I feel a lot of joy at that. Do you feel joy at that? Um, yeah, it's like a sub-series. I'm like geeking out on it. I don't think I've ever done this before, but it just kind of happened. Here's what happened, okay? Two weeks ago, somebody asked the question, okay, pastor, if you say that if you come to Jesus, Jesus forgives you of your past, present, and future sins, how does the judgment make sense then? That was our question two weeks ago. Kind of an easy pitch softball kind of a thing, right? So we went after that and it got us talking about the way Jesus saves people. And I'll just give you a little bit of a summary because it was a massive deal for us two weeks ago. And several of you, even in this room here, gave your life to Jesus Christ for the very first time that week. I've talked to some of you. Um, here's what we talked about. Everything that you've done in your life, the darkness, the selfishness, it's like a guilt pile in your life, right? And somebody's got to pay for it. And most of us try to pay for it ourselves. And Jesus came with better news than that, amen? And he doesn't ask us to come and try to clean up our past or try to make up for our past or even try to get ourselves morally okay to come to God. Jesus isn't waiting around for that. Instead, Jesus came as the only qualified person in human history to die for you and to take your punishment. If you've got a guilt pile here, Jesus died and paid for the guilt pile. He suffered so that you wouldn't have to suffer. And that's good news. Amen? Got a lot of good news today, okay? So Jesus did that for you. And the theologians say that if you come to Jesus and you surrender to him, then his righteousness, his record, his resume gets imparted to you, transferred to your account. And I said imparted righteousness right here in church. And it's only 1026 in the morning. Are you okay? It's a lot. I know. These are big words. Um, you get Jesus' righteousness. When God the Father looks at you, and, and this is back to the judgment, someday when you have your appointment with judgment, and we all will, God will look at you and he will see only the righteousness of Jesus. He will not see your track record. And that's good news for me. It's good news for us all. But him giving that gift to us was not cheap. It wasn't cheap grace. And we talked about that too. It cost him everything in order to give that to you. And it's also not cheap for you because... Even though you don't have to clean up your moral record, you still have to surrender. Say surrender. You have to surrender. You have to surrender everything. And this is hard, especially for people in our culture, because we're not good at surrendering, right? Like it's my career. It's my future. It's my family. It's my truth. It's my everything. We don't like giving that up. And God has no, he has no right to come in and to tell me what my stuff is, but he does. And so when you surrender to Jesus and say, I believe that you rose from the dead and you're Lord of my life, because that's what Romans 10, 9, and 10 says we do to get saved is we surrender to Jesus and say, it's no longer my truth, it's your truth. It's no longer my future, it's your future. It's no longer my bank account, it's your bank account. It's, it's no longer my time schedule, it's your time schedule. Jesus, I live for you now. That's what it is. And that's us giving up a whole heck of a lot, amen? We give up all of that to Jesus and we're gonna live for you now. So surrender is a big deal and it costs us a lot, but we get everything in return. And, and the Bible says that if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. And I don't have to make it happen, and I don't have to pay for it. I just have to give myself to Jesus. Amen? So that was the first week. And then the second week, we said, hey, and if you started with grace, it's not you've got to get to work now as a Christian. It's that you get to live in that grace every single day of your life. And that makes sense to some of us. But for a lot of us, we've got this perfection infection inside of our souls. And we're like, okay, every single day with Jesus, I want to do everything perfectly now. And I want to do all the religious things perfectly now. But aren't you going to heaven? Yes, I'm going to heaven. But God wants me to be perfect in everything, right? No. Because the same Jesus that saved you and the same resume that's come into your life and protects you, it protects you every single day of your life, not just at the judgment. So when the Father sees you, he sees Jesus. Well, that's weird, right? But Romans 8 verse 1 says, there's therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
no matter what you did this morning in the minivan on the way to church. Right? There's no condemnation for you. Because Jesus saw that coming and Jesus died for that too. And that just gives us like this reckless kind of God confidence in our life. And we don't live by obligation and guilt anymore. We live, we live from gratitude. And we worship him for what he's done. And that's love. So we, right, we talked about that. So today it builds on those two points. And today is how do we give it away? If you've been saved by this grace, if you're living by this grace, how do you give this grace to somebody else? Because don't you want to give this grace to somebody else? You all know the Sunday school answer to that, right? Of course, we're supposed to say yes, but think about it for just a second. All you have to do as a red-blooded American is see a good movie and you want to tell everybody about the good movie. Yes? Wakanda forever. It was great. Oh, second service. Wasn't it great? Come on. So I want, you know, not only did I want to experience the joy for myself, I want everybody else to experience the joy. Because that's just natural. That's human. So if Jesus has completely brought joy into my life, I want others to experience the same exact thing. So I don't share this grace because I'm obligated. I don't share this grace because God told me to, even though that's all true. I share this joy and this grace because I want to. And that's the way that this is supposed to to work. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So there was this guy named Todd and he was a programmer and I worked um, as a fellow employee with him and he taught me some things, Todd did, and he was better at programming than I was. And I had a technology career before I was a pastor. And, and um, anyway, we worked in the same facility um, for a long time and, and I got to know Todd and Todd was not a believer. He didn't go to church. And, um, but I enjoyed his personality. He was a former Marine, if that's important to you. He was a former Marine, and, and he was just really, really solid at what he did. And we had all kinds of conversations about different things. I remember going to his house one time, and we watched The Matrix together because The Matrix on DVD was a big deal at that time. And he had cats, and I don't like cats, and I'm sorry to the cats people, but we watched The Matrix, and that was what was important. It was just a good time and, and, and got to know him, got to know his, his uh, fiance and Linda and I went to their wedding and, and that's just, that's the level at which we knew each other, right? And then that went on for years and I remember he and I had this one conversation over lunch. We were in the cafeteria and faith came up and my faith came up and I didn't try to manufacture anything. All of a sudden we just found ourselves talking about it in the midst of the conversation. He said, Josh, I don't really do faith. I believe in science and evolution. And that's just kind of where I'm at. <clears throat> and that was Todd just putting up a wall and just saying, now nah, I'm kind of done here. And he wasn't really inviting debate. He was just saying, this is where I am. And okay, that's fine. And that doesn't mean we can't be friends. And maybe that was the test, right? Can we still be friends? And and so that conversation kind of came to an end, and we continued to do life together. And then eventually he went to work one place, and I went to work a different place, and our lives kind of grew apart. And I didn't see him for a year and a half, two years, and all of a sudden I'm in a grocery store one day, and all of a sudden Todd's there in the middle of an aisle, and he looks different. And he comes up, and he starts talking to me, and he says, um, and he just starts sharing deep things about his life because he was in this place. He says, my marriage is falling apart. I'm worried that I'm going to lose my family. And you're like, geez, I haven't seen you for a year and a half, and all of a sudden you're hitting me with that. But when you're in that kind of a place, don't you do that a little bit? Don't you pull into some of those relationships? Maybe you hadn't gone there before in this way, but now you got to go there, so you go there. And all of a sudden he's ready to go there, and he's like, Josh, what church do you go to? And so I tell him what church, and all of a sudden he starts coming to church, and he still, I don't think, believes any of this stuff. But he just starts coming to church. And eventually he starts coming to Linda and I's life group. And eventually his, his spouse starts coming to the same life group. And we saw their marriage start to rebuild and heal itself. And I saw Todd eventually make a decision to follow Christ. And I saw him get baptized. And his baptism was awesome. And he was freaked out to get baptized in front of all these people, right? And so he's like, could I have a special baptism with just our life group after the service? which is an option, by the way. You can always just let me know you need something like that. And we did, and I got to baptize him personally. And what a day that was. 
And so we continued to be friends, continued to, to do, do life together for several years even after that. And there was one day, and we're having this conversation, we're having this, this, uh, this talk, and, and he just kind of let slip to me that back in his childhood, he had had this uh, stepdad. And the stepdad was a devout Catholic. And the stepdad who was a devout Catholic, his faith was huge to this stepdad. And Todd, in, in the relationship with this stepdad, he started to learn that this was a man of integrity. And this was a man who loved people. This, he was a caring man. And all these things that were good about this stepdad, Todd, over the years, had associated it with his devout faith. And he kind of didn't know what to do with that connection. And here's the thing, you know God gave him that relationship to plant a seed in him, but how long did that seed sit there before it finally bore fruit? And even in the conversation I'd had years ago with him, think about this for a second. I'd had this conversation years ago with him, and we're talking about science and faith and stuff like that. That's not the issue at all. He's got that stepdad thing. You think he was going to let me know about that in that lunch? Heck no. He didn't tell me any of that. Why? Because he wasn't there with me yet. We didn't have that relationship. We didn't have that trust. He wasn't going to put those cards out on the table. And isn't that the way human relationships tend to work? You only get in if I let you in. It's your choice. This is what we talk about when we talk about boundaries. When the Bible says that Jesus stands at the door and knocks, do you know what he's doing? He's saying, let down your boundaries and let me in because God respects your boundaries and God will only come in if you let him in. And it's the same in spiritual relationships. It's the same in human relationships. So let, let me take a right turn. I want to tell you about Paul here because there's some things I want to see with Paul. The Apostle Paul, Paul was this church planter and he was a, a missionary in the New Testament, the first century church. And he was out there and he was trying to share the good news about Jesus, how to have grace with Jesus. He was trying to tell that message to Jewish people and non-Jewish people, non-churched people alike. And here's some, something that Paul said, I think it's important for us. 1 Corinthians 9.19. He says, even though I am a free man with no master... I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. So first off, do you see the passion in Paul's heart? He said, I'll do anything to bring people to Jesus. And he's like, and I'm not a slave, by the way. I'm a free person. I don't owe anybody anything. But even though I don't owe anybody anything, I'm going to live as if I'm people's servants, if that will open their hearts. And he's going to go on and explain what he means by that. Verse 20, when I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I'm with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from the law so that I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. Now that little bit at the end there, what does he mean? He means I don't try to obey all the Old Testament laws, right? Like 600 of them. I'm not going to try and obey all of those. I obey the law of Jesus Christ today, which is to love God and love people. That's what he's going to do. And that's going to be his code. That's going to be his direction, he says. But when I'm with Jewish people, I act one way. And when, I, when I'm with Gentiles, I act a different way, he says. And by the way, Paul does not see that as inauthentic. Many of us would see that as inauthentic. Paul sees it as loving. That's big. So imagine it this way. So he's with Jewish people, and Jewish people don't think that they can eat pork, right? So you go to the buffet, and there's bacon at the buffet, Paul. What do you do? Now he could say, and this is, follow his words here. He could say, I'm free to eat bacon. And he could start a little bacon debate right there. Right? He's got every right to. And he'd probably win that debate. Why? Because Jesus had told Christians in the book of Acts that they could eat pork now under the new law once Jesus had done what he had done. It's a lot of conversation about bacon, amen? I could spend some time here. 
But he doesn't make it about that. I'm not going to have a bacon debate with you. Why? Because if I have a bacon debate, I'm going to distract you from the most important things. And if I distract you from the most important things, you're going to think my opinion about bacon has to do with heaven and hell, and it doesn't. So I'm going to sidestep that issue, and I'm just not eat, eating bacon today, is what he says. I'm just not going to eat bacon today, because I care too much about your soul. I'm not going to distract you. That's love. Do you get it? Okay, let's, let's keep reading the rest of what he says. Verse 22, when I'm with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yea, yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. You know what's so refreshing about those words right there? You see how many times he says everything? I'll do anything that I can do in order to, to rescue some more people. Reminds me of Schindler's List. You ever get to the end of that movie? And he's like, I could have gotten a few more people. Remember that? His desperation, if you know the history of Oscar Schindler, and it's, it's d displayed in that whole movie, he saved, they say, 1,200 Jews from the concentration camps. And you know how he did it? He paid for them all. He bribed Nazi officials during the entire time in order to protect as many people as he could from the gas chambers. By the time they got to the end of the war, Oscar Schindler was bankrupt. He'd spent everything that he was. And Paul's sitting here saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend everything that I am because it's worth it because I might save some. Do you hear him? This is a man under total conviction, not just commanded by God. You got to hear this. Not just commanded by God to share and plant churches because that's not enough. He's been so deeply changed by it himself. He has to pass it on. Because, right, if I've just been given a job, I'm just going to do the minimum maybe. But this guy's out of control. No bacon debates. He'll give it up for you. Whatever you need, I'm going to help you stay focused on just the gospel and I love that about him. D.A. Carson said it like this. He says, in every culture, it is important for the evangelist, the church planner, and the witnessing Christian, that's us, by the way, to flex as far as possible so that the gospel will not be made to appear unnecessarily alien at the merely cultural level. Now, that's some academic stuff right there, right? But look at what he's saying. He's saying sometimes you get in a conversation with people and what gets in the way between you and them is merely cultural. And you start getting yourself in arguments about what separates us, and what separates us is merely cultural. Dare I say, merely political? I, no. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff. But he says, I'm not going to get into that merely stuff. I'm going to flex as much as I can. And by flexing, what I think he means here is I'm going to be faithful to the core gospel. I'm not going to bend on that. Don't bend on that, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Don't come to people and make it seem to them like it's some easy, flippant prayer that they have to pray to God and they don't actually have to surrender their eternal soul. Don't. That's not helping them. Tell them the truth. It's offensive enough. So go ahead and offend them. But make sure your offense is in the gospel. It's not in this other merely cultural stuff. That's what he's saying. Be faithful, but be flexible. And if the gospel offends, then so be it. There's a moment in Acts chapter 17. I'm not going to read it to you. But I just want to show you that Paul actually walks this out very, very clearly. If you read in Acts 17, there's a moment where Paul comes to this spot in Athens. Athens, Greece, right? The, the core of all this ancient philosophy. And he's standing there in this group of all these philosophers who all want to debate him. And they don't know anything about Christianity. They're totally secular. They don't know anything about Judaism or the past. And when Paul goes to them and preaches to them, it sounds different than any other sermon you've ever read from Paul. He doesn't quote scripture once in Acts 17. You won't see it. He actually doesn't even say the name Jesus once, even though he refers to him. But he doesn't say the name Jesus. 
He doesn't talk about the blood. He doesn't talk about the cross. It's wild. He's very, and he puts out these olive branches to them, right? He's talking to them about what they understand. He's talking about creation. He's talking about the fact that God's been calling down to them through the centuries, trying to get at their heart and that they've been worshiping this unknown God and didn't know, the, know his name. And he's like, I actually know the guy's name. And then he leaves it because he doesn't want to overwhelm them. And it's wild. And he even quotes their pagan poets back to them. Why? Because he studied their culture a little bit. Why? Because he cared about them. So he studied their culture a bit, and he quotes their, poem, or their, their poets back to them. It's an olive branch. Do you see this? That's love. That's relationship. That's walking in real human relationships. So he does this in Athens with an unchurched group of people. But let me compare it to another moment where he's, he's going back to Jerusalem and he's going to work with some Jewish people. And it's a very different crowd, right? And he's going there with Timothy, who's one of his fellow apostles. And Timothy had grown up as a Gentile, so he's not circumcised. And if you don't know what circumcision is, I'm not going to get into it because it's Christmas, okay? <laughs> Just not going to do it. I'm just going to use the word here. Because the Jews believe that you had to be circumcised. And Paul writes the entire book of Galatians. We talked about it last week. And says you don't have to be circumcised in order to be saved. But he's taken Timothy grew up as a Gentile, not circumcised. He's taken him into this Jewish spot. And he doesn't want debates. So he asks Timothy as an adult man to get circumcised so that he won't be offensive to them. And Timothy stinking does it. Wow. But this is what Paul's talking about. You see how far he'll go to not be offensive to somebody. Then you might say, well, how would they even have known that Timothy was circumcised? And again, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about <laughs> any of it. There's, I looked this up this week. There's three main causes of heart disease. It's high stress and, and um, uh, blood pressure, high cholesterol, and smoking. The three main causes of heart disease. So let's just say for the sake of argument that you're 65 years old today. And I'm not making eye contact with anybody, so don't worry about it. But let's just say you're 65 years old today. And let's say your personal history is that you've lived a very stressful life your entire life long. Okay, so you got the high blood pressure part. Let's just say that for every single meal of your life, you've eaten a cheeseburger, fries, and a Twinkie for dessert. And you've smoked three cartons of cigarettes per day. I'm exaggerating. I don't, what do I know? Okay, let's just say, and here you are at 65 and you got heart disease. Does it help for me to come in and say, maybe you should back down off the smoking a little bit? I don't think it does. I think probably you need a heart transplant at that point. Sometimes as Christians, we get to know somebody who needs Jesus, and we start talking to them about their behaviors. We start talking to them, and we start getting into arguments and debates with them about things that do not determine where their eternal soul goes. And what they need is a heart transplant. And the thing is, by making the conversation about these behaviors, we confuse them. We don't just get, we don't just get in, in, in the way of the other conversation we want to get to. I'm, I'm not saying that. It's that we imply to them, based on the priority in our conversation, that those are the things that determine where they'll end up. You know how many people come to me and say, Pastor, I'm so surprised that you said that this sin or this sin or this sin does not actually get me to hell. It's only my conversation with Jesus Christ. And why are they confused about that? I don't know if the voice of the church and the voice of Christianity into our culture has been helping people very much. And sometimes it's not that we're saying bad theology. It's the way that we're talking. It's the order that we've put things in. Because our culture hands to us an order. And sometimes we give in to it. They need a heart transplant, is what I would say. 
So Paul says, I want to flex. I want to keep first things and saving things first. Another thing is I think we've got to understand boundaries better than what we understand right now. So here's another illustration. Let's say I'm at the grocery store. And let's say I've got myself a shopping cart and I'm in the Dorito aisle <laughs> getting nacho cheese Doritos. And I filled the cart with nacho cheese Doritos. It sounds good already, <laughs> right? And so I'm, I'm doing what's appropriate and good and right for myself and, and I'm filling up this cart And let's say this guy walks up to me, and you got to see this guy in your mind, right? Like this one guy walks up, and he's absolutely muscular and super fit, right? There's not a fat cell in this guy's body at all. And, and, And he's wearing the clothes. Do you know the clothes that I'm talking about? It's the workout outfit that you wear to the gym, except that's all the clothes he's got in his closet because he's always at the gym. God bless him. He's always at the gym. So there I am in the grocery store with my Doritos, and he comes walking up, and he looks at the Doritos, and he looks at me. He wouldn't look here at all, ever. But he looks, and and he says to me, let's just imagine that he says to me, you know, you could shed a few pounds, and I'm not sure those Doritos are going to help you do that. Now, let's just say that happened. Now, I'm going to say, how dare you, I'm offended. But you know what I'm not going to say after that? It's how dare you, I'm offended. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm not going to say that. Because he's right, right? I'm also not going to say, how dare you, you offend me. Um, You're not qualified to say this. He is qualified. I mean, look at his getup. He's clearly qualified. (laughs) Here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say, how dare you? You don't know me. That's what we're going to say. How dare you? You don't know me. Right? Why? Because it's not about knowledge and qualifications, and it never has been. It's always, follow me, the key to opening the door of a relationship It's relationship. The the key to boundaries lowering is trust and relationship, often time. But it's the knowing somebody that gets them to lower their boundaries and gives you a right to speak into their life. And how many times, just how many times have you walked into a relationship or walked into a discussion, let's say even at Christmas time, around the Christmas table, and somebody has said something to you about your life that they had no right to say. A lot of smiles around the room right now. Yeah. We don't, we don't, we're not there yet, right? We would say, we're not there yet. Whether you should be there or not is a different question, but you're not there yet. Here's another passage, 1 Corinthians 14, 23. And this is Paul talking about the church, and he's talking about Sunday morning service very specifically. And in this, and I'll just say this before we read it, he's talking about speaking in tongues, which if you don't know anything about that, it's a, it's a spiritual gift. It's a supernatural spiritual gift that people would have where they would speak an unknown language in prayer, okay? And people were doing that on Sunday mornings. He's going to refer to that here He says, even so, if unbelievers or people who don't understand these things come into your church meeting and they hear everyone speaking in an unknown language, they will think you are crazy. Say crazy. Crazy. Right? It's crazy. What are you doing? We don't know what you're doing. You're kind of freaking us out. Ever walk into a church before and they were doing something that kind of freaked you out? Yeah, a lot of smiles, a lot of head nods. I got you. Yeah, a lot of us have had that. And again, if we had history, me and your church, if we had built trust over time, maybe I could handle that kind of a teaching if I had something to base it on. But you would end up saying the same thing as you did to the guy in the workout outfit. We're not there yet. I came on a Sunday morning 
and we're not there yet. That's what Paul is saying, verse 24. But if all of you are prophesying and unbelievers or people who don't understand these things come into your meeting, they will be convicted of sin and judged by what you say. So he switches it from speaking in tongues and says, ah, but what if you're speaking English? What if you're teaching in English? What if there's a prophetic supernatural word that gets said in English? Then they understand. He said, now you've gone from a confusing moment to a God moment. So here's another question. Have you ever been in a church service before and you listen to the message or maybe even a, a song that we're worshiping with together? And you say, I don't know how the pastor knew what I was going through this week. But that was just for me. And what are you saying? You're saying, God moved. God did a thing. And when I see God do a thing, I'm ready to go to the next level. So he's saying, maybe Sunday morning services, you need to be a little careful on what you're talking about, on what you're doing. But if God is moving and people have an experience of God, then they want to go deeper with you. And that's a good thing. Trust, trust. There are some highly charged topics in this culture. Would you agree? I've got a slide for you. Here's some big topics. How about marriage and divorce? Immigration, climate change, sexuality and gender, politics, abortion, guns, vaccines. I could go on. There's a lot, amen? amen? How many of you feel real nervous right now that I even put those up there? You're like, you haven't even talked about them yet. I just don't like them on the screen. <laughs> right? We all get there. And what are we wrestling with, right? What we're wrestling with is, do we have a relationship where we can have this conversation? Are we in that spot? And I would say some of us have been to churches before where that stuff gets talked about on a regular basis. And I don't know that that's wise on a Sunday morning. And if I could just say, I don't think it's wise on a Sunday morning because we're building trust. And I think those conversations need to happen. I think they need to happen between parents and kids. I think they need to happen in life groups. I think they need to happen in accountability groups. I think they need to happen in counseling sessions. I think there's a lot of context where we need to talk about these things, where we can, in a trust relationship, open up Bibles together and give them the time that's required. But we got to be careful because we're not going to do brief drive-bys on these and communicate to you that your position on these issues, these topics, is going to determine your heaven and hell. I'm going to give you a minute on that. That's some big stuff. Okay. Mark 2.15. It says, later Levi invited Jesus. Now, if, if, if you're new to the scripture, Levi was a, a name for Matthew who wrote the book of Matthew. And Levi was a tax collector. And tax collectors in Jesus' day were considered people that were betraying their native people, the Jews. And they were taking money and giving it to the Romans. So you're betraying our culture. A lot of times they were seen as thieves that were taking more money than what they needed to take. So Levi invites Jesus and his disciples to his home for dinner. Along with many other tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. And there's other verses I can show you that you're going to see prostitutes in that list. You're going to see sex workers in that list. It's going to make you uncomfortable if you read it right. There were many people of this kind, it says, among Jesus' followers. But when the teachers of religious law who were Pharisees saw Jesus eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? Say scum. scum. 
scum. How dare he have dinner with such scum? And why do they say that? Because they don't want Jesus forming a relationship with these folks. They want Jesus yelling at these folks. They would rather Jesus preach at these folks from a distance. That's what they'd prefer. When Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick sick people do. I mean, how did these dinners go? Like this, this could not have been easy stuff. And, and I get it. I mean, can, can, can you get it for a second? Like him going to dinner with these folks, aren't there going to be people who come along and say, it's as if you're enabling them, Jesus. It's as if you're approving just based on you being there and not making a public statement to us all afterward about how much you disagree with their lifestyles. Don't you owe the public a public statement about your disagreement with their lifestyles? He doesn't make it. He just has dinner with them. And there's conversations, and there's trust building, and there's relationship forming, and there's one-on-one, and wouldn't you give a whole lot of money to be able to hear what they talked about? And some of you are reading a passage like that, and you're like, I bet Jesus was very honest with them about their lifestyle and how destructive it was for them. And maybe he was. And maybe he took that a step at a time. Maybe he saw who came back the next week, and maybe he went deeper with them. Because maybe Jesus understands human relationships. And he waited to build that trust. And I don't see a spot, and I've read them, guys. I've read the Gospels. I don't see a single spot where Jesus preaches a public message against prostitution. And I don't think for a second he agreed with prostitution. But he had some people that he was loving, and he wasn't simultaneously publicly bashing them. You're like, but all he would have been doing was speaking the truth, yes? True. 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 It's a hard thing to put together. And some of you are super theologians, and you're like, Pastor, you're making an argument from silence right now. And making an argument from silence is saying, I don't see this, so maybe it didn't exist. And I'm just admitting to you that, yes, that's what I'm doing. So I'm on a little bit of shaky ground here right now. But I still think it's important that we don't see Jesus doing that. And he spoke against a lot of sins, did he not? But he was loving some people. Okay, so what do we do? What do we actually do? First Peter 3.15, here's our pattern. Talked a lot about what not to do. Let's talk about what we do. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. See how he's saying? Be a Christian. Worship Jesus as Lord. If you are a Christian and that's what you're doing with your life, then you get to the next part of the verse. And then if someone asks you about your hope, As a believer, always be ready to explain it, but do this. Look at these words. Do this in a gentle and respectful way and keep your conscience clear. Okay, so back to the grocery store. What's he saying? He's saying, wait for them to ask. Why? Because then they invited you in. Right? Oh, God, Help this person ask me. Right? But what if they don't ask me? Right. Who are you building relationships with? Who are you going there with? Who are the Todds in your life? Right? Who are you getting to know? Who are you inviting over for dinner? And are you praying? You know, people are like, well, nobody ever asks me, Pastor. No one ever asks me about the hope that's in my life. Then start praying right now. I dare you. Start praying right now. Say, God, I pray that you would take some people in my life and that you would cause them over the next week to start pressing in toward me and saying, you know what, my marriage is a little bit broken. Will you help? Will you talk me through it? Can we go out to coffee? Because I want to talk about my finances. I want to talk about why I'm struggling this Christmas because every time I go through Christmas, it reminds me of the people I've lost. Do you know that's an invitation to talk? I struggle with Christmas because my depression, my anxiety fires right up. I just feel down at Christmas. And someone comes to you and they're inviting you into a conversation. And who knows where that conversation might lead. But it's going to take your time. 
Yes? You're going to have to shut some things down in your life and make space for souls that need Jesus desperately. And then you'll have to answer them when the time comes. You have to tell them the truth. Please tell them the truth. And when you tell them the truth, it says do that with gentleness and do it with respect. Wait a second. I thought sharing my faith was like this used car salesman closing the deal kind of thing that was super, super forceful. No, it's not. And it's not making anybody a project either. Nobody likes that. Would you like that? It's just, no, it's chill. And we're going to have relationship. And we're going to build trust. And when the time comes, I'm going to ask you a question like Todd did with me. It was the right time. I'm like, well, I can't control that. I know. None of us can. Sharing grace is sharing grace. Amen? Okay, last one. Woo! Okay, I, I shared, I, I can't miss this, just real quick. I said, I'm not going after those highly charged topics on a Sunday morning because we're still building. Yes? We're going to keep it focused on the gospel because we're still building. But there are places where those conversations need to happen. And I said, parent and kid, can I just tell you that if you're a parent today and you're like, I would like to talk to my kids about these highly charged topics because the Bible has some setting us free kind of truth to share with us. If you struggle with how to talk to your kids about that, make an appointment with me or with one of our pastors. I would love to sit down with you and walk you through the verses. Would make my day. I love this stuff. So yeah, let me, let me help. Go to your life group leader. Ask those questions there. Take good notes, right? Educate yourself so that you can go deeper on some of those topics. Some of you have been told the Bible says this about some of those topics, and you've been told wrong. There's good correction to get when you start to read the Bible for yourself. It'll blow your mind. But go there. Like, I'm like, hey, it's up to you to decide to go deeper into the relationship, right? Like, you're the one who decides to lower your boundaries and say, yeah, I will go there with you. But some of you come on Sunday mornings and you don't go any farther. And you've been here on Sunday mornings only for years. And you don't ask the big questions because you're afraid of the answers that you'll hear. Oh, that's a hard one, isn't it? Could I just challenge you? You're missing out. Maybe you've stayed in Sunday mornings because Sunday mornings is safe. And maybe you need to get into group. Maybe you need to get into accountability group. Maybe you need a counseling appointment or a pastoral connection so that we can talk about the things that really matter because I think it'll help you. Time for next steps. All right, now for real, the last thing. Okay. So there was this guy, Steve. And I got to end with Steve's story because he's an amazing guy. His wife brought him to church. His wife brought him to church and he came to be a, a compliant, loving husband. Amen? Come on. Some of us have been there. Like we went. We didn't want to go, but we went. And so Steve went. And Steve's a great guy, and getting to know Steve, and we would catfish fish together. And um, he was a guy that always got me outside, doing things outside. Steve's a great guy, and we did cookouts at his house and all this kind of stuff. And Steve would come every single Sunday without fail. He went to life group with us. He had lots of great questions, but he did not believe. And he was very clear at the fact that he did not believe. But he would ask all these questions, and he was willing to go there for 100%. And I don't know how many times he and I had dinner. Again, we're out hunting or fishing, and we're just talking about all these things about God. He was very curious and willing, but he could never believe. And I remember we're having this conversation at a coffee shop, and this is really important. And there's a wall next to us, and he says, Josh, and the wall's white, by the way. And he's like, I feel, I feel like you're telling me this wall's orange. He's like, but I look at this wall, it's not orange. He's like, I can't see what I can't see. And he's struggling. And he's like, you could line up all these Christians that all tell me this wall's orange, but I still see white. He's like, what do I do with that? 
And so we would just talk. And I loved his honesty. A lot of people couldn't have said that. And man, we would talk and I would pray and I prayed for the day that he would see orange. That he would see, he could see what he could not see. And when we moved to Oklahoma, of course, I don't see Steve very much. But every once in a while, because we're both raising kids and all this kind of stuff, and something would pop up and he text, and back when my dad died a few years ago, he texted, and we'll have these conversations on text, and it always ends this way. I'll say, hey, Steve, how's the wall doing? Is it orange yet? And he'll say, not yet. It's all right. I don't know what God has for you, man. I don't know how much space and time you need but I'm praying the day comes. And guys, some of us, what we're called to with the people that we love the most is not to have the exact right phrase that will magically bring them over the edge because a lot of times that's not how it goes. So there are a lot of good things that we need to do that we talked about today. But can I just ask you to pray for your people? Pray for the people that you love the most. I'm praying for Steve. I haven't given up on Steve. Somebody say amen. I haven't given up on Steve yet. Who knows? Why don't you guys stand? Now I want you to think about the Christmas parties you're headed toward. The office holiday parties you're headed into. I said holiday. And the people that you're going to see and what opportunities might you have. Let's pray, Lord God. We pray, Lord, that you would give us opportunities. We pray, Lord, that we would have eyes to see those people that you're stirring in, Holy Spirit. We pray, God, that you would create moments, Lord, where we can speak a truth that maybe we desperately want to share. And I pray, Lord, that you would maybe resurrect in us the joy that we used to have the love for other people that maybe we used to have and bring us back to that place, God, and make us eager. Lord, get us praying again. Get us hoping again. And Lord, I pray that we would be available and respectful and gentle when those moments come. We love you, Jesus, in Christ's name. Amen.